I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, webinar. Um, if you've uh, attended past webinars, you may have noticed an emphasis on multidiscipline, uh, multidisciplinary uh, research, and uh, today is no exception. In fact, I might even go one step further to call this hyperdisciplinary research. Of course, we're all uh, many of us are familiar with O2M technologies and their uh, great partnerships with those in academia and other institutions, uh, which brings uh, great uh, expertise uh, to a multidisciplinary project. Uh, at Duke University, uh, we have uh, three researchers who will be uh, co-presenting today. Uh, Greg Palmer is an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology in the Cancer Biology Division at Duke University Medical Center, where he focuses on cancer progression and therapeutic response, particularly with absorption, scattering, and fluorescence properties in tissues. And so he brings a unique background to this multidisciplinary approach as well. Uh, Yvonne Maury uh, is a physician scientist uh, and also the Butler Harris Assistant Professor of Radiation Oncology at Duke University, where she specializes in developing novel uh, mouse models of head and neck cancer, um, uh, studying head and neck cancer pathogenesis and mechanisms of overcoming radiation and immunotherapy resistance, uh, especially uh, with regard to DNA damage response. Uh, and again, uh, adding a new dimension to this multidisciplinary team. And then finally, uh, both Greg and Yvonne have uh, uh, then uh, collaborated with uh, Ashlyn Rickard, uh, Rickard uh, who has just recently earned her doctoral degree in medical physics at Duke University, uh, where she specialized in diagnostic imaging systems and radiation biology. And she studies uh, uh, tissue oxygen and imaging techniques using optical nanoprobes and Cherenkov emission uh, imaging, uh, which adds uh, a unique aspect as well. But of course, we're most interested in her uh, work over the last uh, two years with Greg and Yvonne that is focused on electron paramagnetic resonance oxygen imaging. Whew. So as you can see, I'm out of breath because there's so much multidisciplinary uh, uh, um, expertise on this team. So uh, I'd like to end there and just turn it right over to them because they have such great, uh, exciting research to present. So um, I'll stop sharing. All right, well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Marty. Um, we will be talking today about a preclinical project evaluating the effects of papaverin on tumor oxygenation and radiosensitization in two different mouse models of cancer, a breast cancer and primary sarcoma model using the GIVA25. And I will start out by just providing um, a basic overview about tumor hypoxia and the clinical relevance, particularly in, uh, in the, with, with regards to radiation therapy sensitivity, as well as some overview about preclinical tumor models and, and um, various models, their strengths and weaknesses. I'll then be passing things over to Greg to talk about the quantification of tumor hypoxia. And then finally, Ashlyn will really be giving us the meat of the, the talk on the papaverin radiation studies in our mouse models. So first, just a brief uh, tumor hypoxia overview. Um, again, we're gonna be focusing on cancer today, but I wanna make note that hypoxia is really important across many clinical um, conditions and can impact outcomes for things like organ transplantation, as, as well as um, uh, high altitude sickness, et cetera. But we're really gonna to focus today on the effects on cancer because hypoxia or reduced oxygen levels in the tumor can really affect the therapeutic e efficacy for both radiation therapy as well as immune therapy and chemotherapy, which are our main strategies to treat cancer. But despite the impact of hypoxia on outcomes for these patients, there really are no clinically approved methods for ameliorating hypoxia clinically. Now, I, I want to make note that hypoxia really is a, an important issue across multiple different tumor types. So here I'm, I'm showing a figure of oxygen concentration in multiple different tumor types compared to their adjacent normal tissues. And you can see that the tumors are, are really universally lower in terms of oxygen pressure, which provides the potential for a nice therapeutic window if we're able to come up with strategies to really target these hypoxic tissues. Now, in the, the very simplest terms, uh, ox hypoxia just represents a mismatch between the oxygen demand and supply with insufficient supply for the demand. And I'm showing here the, the kind of normal vasculature versus a tumor vasculature, which tends to be much more disorganized and often have shunt loops that can lead to more tumor hypoxia. And, and in fact, that's an oversimplification. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, different features but there are so many features within tumors that also tend to contribute to hypoxia relative to the adjacent normal tissues. Again, like I mentioned, shunt flow, decreased vascular density, and often a lot of attention has been paid to the uh, inefficiency of blood vessels within uh, tumor tissues. 
One of the other challenges when looking at hypoxia in terms of tumor uh, or cancer is that there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity, both spatially within tumors, as well as temporal heterogeneity in hypoxia. And these factors really make it important for us to have good clinical methods of being able to evaluate hypoxia in real time with, as well as with spatial differentiation. Now, I am a radiation oncologist, so my, my interest in hypoxia largely stems from the issue of radiation resistance that is promoted by hypoxia. So this is showing three different breast cancer cell lines with a clonogenic assay that's indicating their radiation sensitivity, where across the x-axis, we have increasing radiation dose, Across the y-axis is a logarithmic scale of surviving cells. Uh, and what you can see is that in normoxic conditions, each of these black lines are shifted to the left relative to the gray lines where, uh, where cells are treated under hypoxic conditions with radiation. And this really emphasizes that there is a tumor cell intrinsic radiation resistance in tumors under hypoxic conditions. Now, of course, we're not treating patients um, in a dish. We are treating patients with radiation therapy um, in, in vivo. And I wanna just outline, show a couple of examples um, from early studies that use direct hypoxia measurements in patients that showed how oxygenation status correlates with outcomes in patients getting radiation therapy. So on the left is a study in soft tissue sarcomas, where you can see that those patients who had higher levels of oxygen in the tumor with a, a 10 millimeter mercury cutoff had better outcomes in terms of freedom from tumor uh, re recurrence. And, and similarly in head and neck cancer here, disease-free survival is significantly improved for patients with higher oxygen levels in their tumor at baseline. And again, both of these studies were based on patients who received definitive radiation therapy. And there's also another interesting feature um, of the sarcoma study, which showed not only that, that the hypoxia status affect outcomes with radiation, but also those tumors with a, a lower median oxygen level were more likely to metastasize uh, than those with higher oxygen levels, which indicates that there is also some tumor biology difference um, based on these hypoxic microenvironment. Now, hypoxia does not just affect radiation therapy um, sensitivity, it also can affect drug resistance. So I've just put along the side here, several different chemotherapeutic agents and small molecule inhibitors that have been shown to uh, have more drug resistance in the setting of hypoxia. And th this occurs through many different mechanisms, uh, largely through upregulation of, of, of HIF-1 and signaling that can affect multiple different uh, things, as well as the effects on the tumor microenvironment acidity and changes in multidrug transporters that can lead to uh, these drugs more likely being ejected from the cell or not entering the tumor cell in the setting of hypoxia. Now, um, recently immunotherapy, of course, has gained a lot of attention for cancer treatment. And I, I wanted to just highlight that hypoxia also can promote an, a very immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And this is, is largely related to uh, the production of certain chemokines that tend to lead to attraction of, into the tumor microenvironment of in, immunosuppressive cells, such as regulatory T cells and myeloid derived suppressor cells but also uh, there tend to be uh, effects in terms of the macrophage, um, M1 to M2 uh, macrophage ratio with there being fewer anti-tumor M1 macrophages and more of the immunosuppressive M2 macrophages in the setting of hypoxia. And, and this can also affect the influx of dendritic cells as well as cytotoxic T cells that are all important for generating an anti-tumor immune response. And if we go one, one level beyond that, there's, of course, immune checkpoint blockades such as anti-PD-1 therapies like pembrolizumab and nivolumab have gained a lot of attention across multiple different tumor types. Um, and I, I wanted to just note that the PDL one which is this immunosuppressive molecule that's often expressed on the cell surface of tumor cells, actually gets upregulated in the setting of hypoxia due to HIF signaling. And in addition, there are changes that can occur um, to the PDL one glycosylation um, in the setting of hypoxia that actually can alter the ability of these anti-PDL1 antibodies that are used therapeutically to bind PDL1. So really just showing that across multiple different cancer therapies, hypoxia is, is really impactful. So with that in mind, of course, uh, there's been a lot of attention in trying to develop therapeutic interventions for hypoxic tumors. Um, and there are many different strategies to do this. Um, the simplest involve increasing oxygen supply um, so through increasing either oxygen within the blood um, or through vasodilation, as well as decreasing oxygen demand um, in terms of the, the tumor cells themselves. 
And there are also um, some uh, kind of hypoxia activated prodrugs that are only active in the setting of hypoxia. In addition, other, other uh, strategies have included targeting uh, HIF, which I've mentioned, as well as VEGF, as well as carbonic, carbonic anhydrase 9. Though really most of the attention clinically has been on this improving oxygen delivery through uh, strategies such as hyperbaric oxygen, as well as um, the carbogen or nicotinamide to increase perfusion. Um, and then mitochondrial inhibitors, um, which again are, are really trying to decrease the oxygen demand within the tumors, such as metformin and, and the drug we'll be talking about today, papaverin. And then finally, there, there are uh, hypoxic cytotoxins, as well as some oxygen mimetics that have been used in combination with radiation therapy. Now, um, I, I treat head and neck cancer um, clinically, so I, I just wanted to use this as an example to show you, if you can see the very small writing along the left, there have been studies that have been going on since the early 70s up through the early 2000s that have tried to look at different uh, ways to modify tumor hypoxia in order to improve outcome, how, outcomes for patients with head and neck cancer. And each of these individual trials, or the vast majority of them, you can see that the 95% confidence interval crosses over the line. But in general, these, these studies do show that the patients had better local regional tumor control with the addition of a hypoxic modifier. And when all of these trials are summed up together in this meta-analysis, you can see here at the bottom that hypoxic modification does improve local regional control for head and neck cancer. And in fact, the same paper also showed improvement in disease-free and overall survival. So, you know, really that, that makes me think back to why were all of these, these studies so unsuccessful when we really combine them together, we can see some promising results. And, and one factor was just the, the fact that these were underpowered uh, studies. Um, relatively small studies. And indeed, a lot of the, the ways that we try to improve oxygen delivery, such as through carbogen or hyperbaric oxygen, are really challenging to coordinate in, in combination with radiation therapy. One of the other really key factors uh, that we are going to highlight today in our preclinical study as well is that most of these hypoxia modification studies did not do any sort of pre-screening to select for patients who have tumor hypoxia. And so certainly for those patients who do not have tumor hypoxia, it is unlikely that they're going to get any benefit from these hypoxic modifications. There also were um, issues with excessive toxicity, despite promising preclinical results for many of these interventions. And this is just a reminder that we can often do a very good job of curing things in mice, but uh, these results don't always translate into humans. And part of this can be because our preclinical tumor models often do not really adequately recapitulate the human tumor microenvironment that tends to develop over many weeks to months as compared to the, the days to weeks that our mouse models typically develop in. And then finally, most of these clinical trials really have focused on, on increasing oxygen delivery. Um, and some work by Mark Dutlers has shown that this really is not a particularly efficient way to reduce tumor hypoxia. And a better way to do it is probably through reducing oxygen consumption within the tissues, which can be much more efficient than just trying to increase the oxygen delivery and also may have some logistical advantages in the clinic. As I mentioned, these things such as um, uh, carbogen and hyperbaric oxygen being very difficult to, to coordinate. And, and, and so with that in mind, um, papaverin is the drug that we're going to be talking about a bit today, um, which was actually uh, through a study I'll show in a moment able to reduce hypoxia about by about 30%. And um, in these models that Mark Dewhurst has performed, this 30% reproduction is, is really predicted to be sufficient to eliminate tumor hypoxia. So this, this study um, by Benej et al. that was published a few years ago in PNAS looked at a few different mouse models, but I'm showing here the E0771, which is a murine breast cancer syngeneic transplant model. And what you can see here um, is in black when uh, uh, the papaverin was dosed to these animals, you see an increase in the normalized uh, relative oxygen level within the tumor compared to mice that were treated just with saline. And the papaverin mechanism of action is through blocking mitochondrial complex one, which leads to reduced oxygen consumption. And interestingly, this did translate in their study into improvement in radiosensitization. So you can see here, the papaverin alone compared to the control really did not cause much change in tumor growth delay. Radiation alone did lead to slowed tumor growth, but the combination of papaverin with radiation was the most promising. Now I'm gonna pause here to just take a moment to discuss um, different mouse models that are relevant to our talk for today. 
Um, so, you know, we are, we will be again using the E0771 model, which is a transplant model in, in mice. Um, there are, of course, also um, many models that are based on patient-derived xenografts, um, where tumor tissue are, are is taken from patients and uh, inserted into immunocompromised mice, or cell lines are derived from these tu human tumor tissues and implanted into mice. Um, we're really focusing more on these syngenetic murine models today, both the E0771, which is a, a transplant model, but also a genetically engineered mouse model, which I wanna highlight some of the advantages for this in terms of studying the tumor microenvironment is really the slow time to tumor onset, as well as the fact that these tumors develop under the pressure of constant immune surveillance. And they have more time to really develop mature blood vasculature and have less um, vascular fragility compared to these transplant, both PDX and syngenetic transplant models. So relevant to that, the, one of the models that Ashton will be presenting data from is from this P53 MCA model, which is a genetically engineered model in which the P53 tumor suppressor gene uh, is flanked uh, by these LOXP sites, which can be specifically recognized by Cree recombinase to then delete these exons from P53, leading to uh, the lack of P53 expression. And in this model, we use an adenovirus to deliver the Cree recombinase to mice that have these P53 flox alleles. And we also deliver a carcinogen called MCA or 3-methylcholin-3 to add additional mutational burden. And this model was really a, a built in order to build upon a more commonly used KRAS P53 model or KP model in which tumors are induced by expression of oncogenic KRAS, again, through Cree-mediated deletion of a stop cassette preceding oncogenic KRAS oncogenic KRAS, and then deletion of P53. And I'm shown at the right here is the mutational load for these two tumor models. And a lot of the um, kind of complaints about genetically engineered mouse models are the, the low mutational load and the fact that that tends to not very well recapitulate human tumors. Whereas you can see the P53 MCA model that, that we use has a much higher mutational load, more in line with, with human sarcomas. And both models take a median time to arise of about 10 to 12 weeks, again, allowing plenty of time uh, for these tumors to develop a strong um, intact vasculature network. Finally, I just wanna highlight um, one other method of generating these, these uh, primary tumor models or sarcoma um, that we've been using more recently, which is to really eliminate the complex genetic um, necessity of breeding mice with multiple conditional alleles. We've also adapted using CRISPR-Cas9 technology in order to knock out P53. So for this study we'll present today, we used an adenovirus that expresses Cas9, as well as guide RNAs to target P53 in order to cause that P53 knockout, and then again, add the exposure to MCA. And the time to tumor onset is similar to that Crelox P system that I mentioned before. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Greg uh, to talk a bit more about measuring tumor hypoxia. Thanks. All right, so like Yvonne nicely kind of summarized, you know, one of the one of the key factors in these types of hypoxia mitigating studies is to be able to actually measure hypoxia both for pre-screening and also to verify that we're having the effect that we want to have clinically. And so I'll just very quickly summarize the methods that we use to quantify hypoxia in this study and and provide a you know very brief context for you know with the commonly used clinical systems. So, yeah. so basically what we ideally would like to have, um, you know, in light of some kind of, kind of the spatial and temporal limitations of, of understanding tumor hypoxia in radiation biology is, you know, high, high spatial resolution, high temporal resolution and good sensitivity, especially to low, to low oxygen tensions. Um, and then ideally we'd like to have direct quantification of absolute uh, tissue PO2 and also to have it be non-invasive, non-destructive so we can do repeated, repeated measurements. Uh, and so I'll, you know, I'll kind of very briefly summarize some of the widely available clinical uh, techniques, uh, first starting with optical approaches um, and, the, you know, and 
and, and, and some of the data as well that Yvonne talked about, we're using more needle-based sensors, which are which also have, have a role clinically, but of course those are invasive and you really only kind of give you a point uh, sampling of, of tumor hypoxia. Um, there are optical approaches it, and and I'll, I'll and we actually use one of one of these as a spectroscopic technique where we can quantify oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Um, and the the approach the approach that that was used um, basically is, is a diffuse reflectance spectroscopy. So we have a light source, which is a fiber optic probe that's placed in contact with the tissue surface. And then we can use uh, you know, optical spectroscopy to basically interrogate the light, the light that is scattered and absorbed within the tissue, and some fraction of that light is returned to the to the detector. And it's uh, it's um, the signal intensity is wavelength dependent, and it's dependent on the absorption and scattering properties within the tissue. And the dominant absorber within tissue is hemoglobin in the visible wavelength range. So we have oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, uh, which we can use, use spectroscopic techniques to extract out those uh, under you know, the relative concentrations and get the hemoglobin oxygen saturation. Um, and for this purpose, we use the, uh, a commercial system with a xenoscope, which has a, a fiber optic probe, like in the schematic there, where it's, it basically gives a kind of a, a volume sample um, point measurement, and then we can, um, through modeling, extract out the hemoglobin saturation. And I guess I should point out too, I'm, um, I'm, I'm uh, personally involved with this company, Zenlux, that's, that's making this system, just for a disclaimer. And so that was one of the techniques that we applied. And the nice thing about this, this technique is that we can, we can, you know, it's a portable system, so we can make measurements very quickly and repeatedly. Um, in the animals without the need for an exogenous uh, contrast agent. But the limitation, I guess, is that it's more indirect. We're, so we're looking at, at uh, vascular oxygenation. Uh, and, th and then just very, very briefly, there are, you know, other clinical, clinically relevant techniques, MRI, so if, you know, oxygen enhanced MRI, bold MRI. These are, you know, very nice, get, getting good spatial contrast, uh, spatial resolution. And but they're they're more uh, relative measurements of of, of um, hypoxia or changes in hypoxia over time. Uh, PET there are um, uh, PET agents like F miso where they are preferentially accumulated within within hypoxic regions. Um, but again, that's more that that also is more of a relative measurement. Um, so it doesn't doesn't quite fit all the all the um, ideal characteristics that we're looking for. Um, there are other kind of specialized techniques, and one of those I'll, I'll talk about is EPR, electron pair magnetic resonance. Um, and just to kind of give a very brief introduction about that. So I'm assuming most of the people on this, um, in the audience here are familiar with this, but so we, we were using the, I guess you could say the first generation um, commercial system, the Jiva from O2M, which is using uh, EPR, which is you can you, you could think as kind of analogous to MRI, but using electron electron spin um, as a source of contrast, and it's it, in particular using a, a spin probe triddle, which is injected uh, intravenously, and um, triddle so triddle interacts with oxygen, which is, which is also paramagnetic, and so it it that the the presence of oxygen alters the, the, the decay rate of the, of the EPR signal. And so we can directly calibrate that, that, that uh, T1 relaxation rate to derive the, the absolute PO2 within the tissue and you know, provide a nice high resolution uh, map of tissue PO2, which is, which is really what we ideally need to have for uh, you know, understanding Tumor, tumor biology and radiation and radiation response. Let's see. Oh. Oh, there we go. So here, here are just kind of brief specifications of the system. So we get you, you know, and this is this system's designed for imaging mice and 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 and, and mouse tumors in particular. So we have a 
a resonator that the, the uh, a tumor grown on the on the flank can be can be inserted into the resonator to provide imaging of the whole tumor, like you saw in the previous figure, with good you know spatial and temporal resolution, and also good resolution of PO2. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it over to Ashton to cover the, the actual experiment that was done. Okay, so hopefully everybody knows a lot now about <laughs> everything that we had to know leading up to this. So uh, what we were testing were basically three hypotheses. We wanted to test that papaverin causes a significant increase in tumor hypoxia. And so this was just to sort of confirm what's been previously published. We wanted to see if papaverin had a significant radiosensitizing effect in both of our tumor models. And then also if we could pre-screen for hypoxia, as Yvonne mentioned, that's a pretty important parameter, clinically speaking. And if EPR is able to do that effectively, then that would be, that would be great. So um, first hypothesis here, I'm just gonna show sort of how we approach this. We only tested this in the EO771 flank tumor. Yvonne mentioned that the primary sarcoma, it does take quite a while to um, develop. And due to COVID, we were on a, a bit of a constraint. So we just wanted to really recapitulate what the Benage et al. had shown in their EO771 model. And so we developed our flank tumor, we took some baseline images, and then we tested three doses, our control, of course, uh, the two make per kg dose is the clinically used dose. And then we adjusted that a bit higher and tested for the four make per kg dose. And it takes a little bit for it to reach its kind of maximal uh, activity. So we waited about 90 minutes and then took a post papaverin image. We also took a few uh, anatomical images, um, MRI, and we used contrast enhanced cone beam CT for tumor contouring. And so this is uh, just some representative images of what we obtained. So we have our three doses, and then we have our um, tumors here in black, kind of pre-treatment and post-treatment. You can see there's a lot of hetero heterogeneity, even in the you know, saline alone group. So it's, um, it's pretty nice to see that the EPR system is able to really highlight that even you know, outside of the tumor, some of the, the changes over time. Uh, here I'm showing the median PO2. So I took two ROIs to analyze the tumor alone, and then in addition, the whole volume. One of the um, things that we want to know is if the papaverin is also going to significantly change the normal tissue. Um, when we're considering radiation, of course, we want to minimize normal tissue damage. So if we're sensitizing everything, then perhaps it's not quite as helpful as we thought. So um, here on the left, we have um, the entire leg plus tumor, that's the whole volume. We have that for all of the doses. And the two meg per kg is the only one that had a significant difference between the baseline here in blue and the post papaverin values in red. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that we are seeing just some, some changes in the tumor over time. There are a lot of confounding variables that we didn't really account for, including ones that are really hard to, like, of course, the mice were anesthetized, um, and that's going to be a sort of indiv individualized uh, experience for each mouse. Um, but one of the things that we just sort of saw as we were taking some serial images is that the EPR has high enough um, temporal resolution to see some changes that could be due to cycling hypoxia. So uh, that would be a really exciting thing for someone to look at later. Um, but we, we could be seeing a lot of these confounding factors. So. Um, we were quite happy, though, that the clinical dose, this is the same dose reported by the other uh, study, was the one that we saw the most major effect. Uh, we also used, as Greg introduced, the Xenoscope system um, to test if we can also recapitulate what's happening optically speaking. So since this is such a more commonly used system, we would want to also be able to see changes in papaverin in a very commonly used application. So we tested um, four different vascular parameters, or well, two different parameters, and then two di different additional fluorescence parameters. Of course, oxygenated hemoglobin. We also tested total hemoglobin. The 2-NBDG is a fluorescent marker for glucose uptake and kind of metabolic activity. And then TMRE is another fluorescent 
probe that looks at mitochondrial membrane potential. The only one that really was effective at showing a, a change due to papaverin was the um, oxygenated hemoglobin. So we did see that um, not only was there a difference between the saline group and the papaverin group, but that you know, compared to baseline values, the papaverin group shows um, a significant change. So we were, we were quite pleased with this. This reflects past studies. So now that we've kind of concluded our, our first hypothesis of yes, papaverin does induce oxygen changes in these tumors, we wanted to, of course, test for uh, any radiosensitizing effect. So we developed two different um, studies here. Um, looking only here at this top bit, we have our EO771 tumor line. I kind of showed already these DRS measurements with the xenoscope. Um, after they obtained these measurements, they were radiated with 20 gray of radiation, or, you know, of course, we had to control the sham radiation. The primary sarcoma flank tumor, we used the GEVA to take a baseline oxygen image pre-treatment. Then, of course, we added the papaverin, and we're using the 2 meg per kg dose here. Then we radiated again at 20 gray and then took an additional image. So that were, was our, our two different studies. And just looking here at the EO771 for a moment, we're not seeing any effect um, for the therapeutic group. So we have our control groups here, but we have our radiation alone and radiation plus papaverin groups and survival, it has no effect. And similarly in the tumor growth, there's no delay due to papaverin. We're trending towards that. Um, Cure-wise, 50% of the mice in the radiation alone group were cured, and 70% of the mice in the radiation plus papaverin group were cured. So, so perhaps if we had a higher powered study, we would see a better separation there, but perhaps not. Uh, we're using a, a much higher dose than previous studies. So we're looking at 20 gray versus five gray in the published studies. So that may also have an effect. Looking here at the primary sarcoma model, I think it's quite obvious that there is no difference at all um, survival wise or tumor growth wise uh, comparing radiation alone and radiation plus papaverin. So our second hypothesis, um, and arguably the more important one, is not being shown properly in our data here, which happens. But could we predict these outcomes with our um, two different uh, measurements? We first used, of course, the indirect method, that's the optical xenolux. We measure, just to remind you, the saturated hemoglobin, total hemoglobin, glucose uptake, and mitochondrial membrane potential. And we input those plus the treatments into a multivariable linear regression model that dropped out any insignificant terms. So we had total hemoglobin and the treatments were predictors, significant predictors, for early tumor uh, responses. So we chose a, an early responder cutoff. This was when the tumors that failed to respond in the radiation groups and the radiation plus the papaverin groups, when they reached their pre-treatment volume again, that's when we cut it off. And so after that, they stopped responding or continued to respond and be cured. And we see that our model actually did a, a fairly good job at showing this here in this graph. We have the actual tumor volumes compared to the predicted tumor volumes. And especially for the treatment groups, it's, it's pretty accurate. And we have a nice healthy R squared of 0.85. So this is um, something that has been seen across the literature. Total hemoglobin is actually a pretty good indicator. There was a study that showed that for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and breast cancers in humans, this was also a great indicator for um, treatment efficacy. For the primary sarcoma, we had a different analysis at our disposal. So we looked at the Cox hazard regression model. This is used uh, very often. You'll see it in clinical trial results. And when we input the EPR data, you know, the median PO2, the hypoxic fraction and the treatments, the hypoxic fraction was a significant hazard. And as, you know, as the hypoxic fraction increases, the hazard is bigger. So this is Luckily, no surprise, this is what Yvonne showed earlier in the human data, and we're seeing this in our mouse data too. And so this was a very nice 
result that we're, we're quite happy with. And, um, and so, great. Our third hypothesis, we, we could predict for this even if the treatment didn't work. So, that, so that's really nice. And as kind of the, the last thing I really wanted to show was what happened when we went back to our data in the sarcoma model and we separated each group into normoxic tumors at baseline or hypoxic tumors at baseline. So this would be the pre-screening. Um, we did it retrospectively. And let me go through each of these sort of slowly. So this is only looking at radiation treated tumors and we're looking at normoxic tumors at baseline in red and hypoxic tumors in blue. And we see that hypoxic tumors are not responding as well to radiation. Um, fantastic. So we've confirmed that hypoxic tumors are radio resistant. Um, we also see this in the papaverin treated group. So again, we have normoxic tumors in purple and in green we have the hypoxic tumors and they have a um, increased tumor growth here. So this is, this is so far no surprise, but it's really nice to see that we were able to separate our data effectively. We also see that if we look now only in normoxic tumors and try to determine if the pattern had any effect on just uh, tumors that had very little hypoxia at baseline, there's no effect. So this is actually quite helpful because if clinically speaking, there isn't a reliable method yet to pre-screen for hypoxia, the kind of last thing you want is for the normoxic tumors that get mixed in for those to um, have a, you know, de deleterious effect from the therapy that you're trying. So that's so far so good. The, the really kind of surprising thing is that if we compare the tumors, um, the hypoxic tumors alone, so comparing radiation alone and adding papaverin, the papaverin makes things worse for hypoxic tumors compared to doing just radiation. And this is, you know, kind of the opposite of what we were hoping to see. But it's, it's not quite as surprising if we think back on what papaverin is clinically used for. You know, it's a vasodilator, and that can, depending on the tumor, it can kind of go two ways. It can sometimes make things worse just depending on the vascular tree and, you know, how many shunt loops there are. Um, and the fact that we're using a primary model that has mature vasculature. So the EO771 tumor would probably not have any notable vasodilation effect that we would be seeing in our data. With a tumor that has that mature vasculature that will respond, we, we should see that effect. And that might be what we're seeing here is kind of a combination where the, the dilation effect is having, you know, a negative effect on the hypoxic tumors and that may need to be accounted for more carefully because the oxygen consumption rate change is not having, um, you know, a, a big enough effect to overcome that. So, um, you know, that's, that's not great, except now we have a lot of tools at our disposal to test for that. So to kind of bring this all back together, we did find that papaverin causes a significant increase in tumor oxygen. We did not find that it had a significant radiosensitizing effect. And I just want to point out again that this is, you know, we've, we've kind of simplified this a lot in our studies and we didn't in, you know, test multiple fractionation schemes or multiple radiation doses. So, you know, that could have a pretty tremendous effect on whether or not it's helpful or not. Um, but we did find that we could pre-screen for tumors using the GIVA and that was um, really helpful for predicting treatment effects and then also sort of sorting out what's happening in normoxic tumors and hypoxic tumors. And as far as where we could go from here, um, I think it's maybe fairly obvious that we need some, at least as far as papaverin is concerned, we need some multimodality imaging. We need to include things like diffusion imaging. I mean, we have all of these things and we should be using them, um, combining EPR and DCE, for example, and then also, um, measuring what the vascular load is and, and where we're seeing the biggest effects from papaverin. And then in addition, um, we have, as Yvonne so nicely showed, a lot of primary tumors models that are um, pretty reasonable to use. I mean, it does take longer for the tumors to grow, but you know we have those and we should really be using them. 
because if we're you know trying to translate to the clinic then we need to be using the most clinically applicable tumor model that there is because if we're just going to be basing this on the EO771 model for example our conclusion might be that at 5 gray papaverin has a tremendous radiosensitizing effect and we should go in clinically 20 gray maybe it's more complicated and it needs a different radiation fractionation the the sarcoma kind of showed a different story and suggests that there's there's a lot of things happening within the tumor that we need to account for before we move into the clinic. So that is all we have. Of course, there were a lot of people who contributed to this. We had, of course, the, um, the O2M team, in addition to you know, Dr. Halpern and a couple of their people. We had a lot of people at Duke that were very helpful. Narissa and Alex were so helpful with measuring mice, getting all of them treated. We have some MRI helpers and then um, also the, we use liposomal iodine contrast enhanced cone beam CTs. So a lot of moving parts and it was, um, it was quite a wonderful experience. And then of course we can't forget the money that made it all happen. Well, very good. Well, thank you for that multi-dimensional, multi-faceted uh, presentation. Uh, we have time for uh, some uh, questions. Uh, 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 for everybody uh, who's joined us today, feel free to use the chat. I think you can also unmute yourself and uh, uh, just uh, enjoy in the uh, conversation, ask a question and join in. So I'll monitor the chat. Uh, uh, like to ask if anybody would like to uh, start uh, by uh, unmuting themselves. Well, Ashlyn, just to get the ball rolling, there is a question that Tim McMahon asked uh, from uh, in the chat about, uh, you know, considering, as you brought up, uh, papaverine is a vasodilator. Is there a way with imaging to distinguish O2 changes from vascular network change uh, blood flow, for example? So you have thoughts on mm -hmm. vascular perfusion, vascular blood, blood flow, how that could be measured in conjunction with the PRI? Hi, Mort Marty and uh, Thank you. Ashlyn. Hi. Hi. I asked, hey, Ashlyn, Greg, and, and Yvonne, that was great. Thank you. Um, I asked the question about halfway through, and then Ashlyn proceeded to answer it um, very well. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was kind of guessing that. Anything you want to expand upon, Ashlyn, uh, with regard to that? Um. Well, I, I think that... Well, I think that it'd actually be quite quite challenging to do, but um, I've heard that there's a few people working on DCE and EPR combinations, and and that seems to be kind of the more straightforward one to look at, you know, diffusion parameters, and then, uh, you know, there's as long as you have, you know, your kind of standard MR in in with all of this, you know, you can just sort of keep adding, you know, you can get a, a lot of nice um, anatomical information. You could add bold to that, so. I think that this is one of those things where it just really needs a lot of that before it goes really any any further. Because um, I, I really don't know how you would be able to determine that without a lot of functional imaging. I could ask a follow-up while we're waiting for others. Um, uh, often uh, the topic of heterogeneity comes up during imaging. You briefly mentioned that uh, uh, might be good to uh, um, describe it as regionality uh, rather than pixel-wise heterogeneity. Certainly you see um, different areas within your tumor map that are red and blue and yellow. Uh, would you have advice about uh, whether the hypoxia matches where the tumor is exactly, or is there spillover into normal tissues with regard to the hypoxic region, or vice versa? Do you see a remarkably normoxic uh, part of the tumor uh, that is next to the normal tissue? I mean, I personally saw that um, as far as the EO771 tumor was concerned. There was a lot of regionality. You know, you would have, you know, an area that was extremely hypoxic and then areas that were just totally normal looking. Um, as far as the, the kind of normal tissue surrounding it, it was interesting to see the changes there. You know, it wasn't all just, you know, red, but it was all, you know, reasonable. The sarcoma, on the other hand, 
Um, so this is intramuscular, so it's not subcutaneous like the EO771. That appeared to often show as almost totally hypoxic without very much regional change or pretty normal looking, you know, maybe a few small regions here and there, but, um, but that was a pretty dramatic change before we even got into analyzing the data of, oh, this is, this is a hypoxic tumor. It is all blue. That, that's a very important question. We, we actually see in, in uh, non-immune compromised animals uh, with uh, fairly highly metabolic tie, uh, hide uh, tissues and a, a follicular hypoxia that's also evident on some of the animal models uh, uh, using uh, uh, nitroimidazole retention. Uh, and, and so uh, you have to be careful about very highly metabolic and, and uh, generally more, more poorly oxygenated normal tissues. Uh, in depending on the model and obviously depending on the tumor. Uh, we're working on uh, trying to derive an algorithm by which to uh, uh, improve the accuracy of uh, fluoromycinidazole PET scans. Uh, and we're finding that there is some carryover uh, of, a, of a general algorithm based on dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. Uh, into improving the accuracy using the the EPR as as a, our standard, uh, and we have yet to to uh, uh, to begin a clinical protocol to see if it increases uh, the uh, uh, the accuracy. Uh, our initial experiments uh, tried to simply uh, identify. Uh, a large fraction, but not by any chance a complete fraction of hypoxic voxels, uh, which we defined as those less than 10 tor. Uh, and we found that there was no difference in the outcomes. When we, when we went to greater than 98 or 99 percent of the voxels of the tumor greater uh, that were hypoxic, uh, that were hypoxic uh, being identified and being radiated uh, using uh, uh, some uh, 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 tungsten loaded plastic blocks uh, to uh, exclude uh, hypoxic voxels, comparing well oxygenated tumor boosts uh, to uh, normal uh, oxy oxygenated tumor uh, boosts of approximately the same integral volume. Uh, we have significant differences in three histology. So, so it's important to try to get all of the uh, the hypoxic voxels. That was that was our lesson. And finally, um, it, because we're interested in curing tumors uh, as, a, as a radiation oncologist, uh, I think it's important, though expensive, to try to do clonogenic uh, uh, survival analyses over a reasonably long period of time uh, for animals as a, an experimental paradigm. And um, and and, uh, and that's I, th I think we can get confused uh, by by the uh, um, by the use of uh, um, uh, variable but non curative doses uh, in in our experimentations. I'm looking at uh, Tim's questions, and can we use? changes due to the network changes as opposed to oxygen consumption. And I think if we do uh, spatial imaging along with uh, oxygen imaging, we should have some understanding of uh, change in vascular network versus uh, oxygen consumption. So does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Uh, my name is Naveen Vishwakarma and I'm biologist at O2M. Um, this, uh, since E0771 is a syngenic line, uh, it's just a suggestion like, instead of using a immunocompromised mice, if we can use, if 
uh, you know, competent like C57 background, I think there will be more, we can see more effect of this radiation plus papaverine because of the role of immune system there. Uh, because we did use, so the EO771 is a, is a mouse. Yeah. Um, so we did use the C57s. Oh, so the background was C57. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, yeah, no, but you make a very good point because the previously published study that we were sort of comparing with, they did not use C57s, they used yeah. nude mice. And so we additionally considered that as a reason as to why they may have seen a different effect as we did. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. What was the image formation and reconstruction? Which, uh, is it uh, projection reconstruction or uh, uh, whether it was phase encoding? For, for the oxygen measurements that are presented, it's primarily fit, uh, projection reconstruction. Okay. And how long uh, did it take for a 3D set, data set? For, for the Jiva, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. I, I believe uh, Ashlyn was using 10 minute imaging sequence. Is that right, Ashlyn? I see, but- uh, I think 674 projection, if I'm mm -hmm. correct. Yes. So, because, uh, eight uh, or 10 delays in T1 measurement. Oh, okay, you were also mentioning about cyclic hypoxia. Did uh, you have, do you have any data on that? Uh, uh, which shows uh, the peripheries uh, cycling in and out and the core in chronic, chronically hypoxia? We, we did do a few experiments kind of early on as we were um, kind of learning the technology where we mm -hmm. did, you know, longer, um, longer experiments where we just sort of serially imaged. And we did see some changes. You know, mm -hmm. it was really difficult to determine if it was solely due to cycling hypoxia. The EO771 is, is very regionally diverse. And so while we saw some regions kind of remain the same and some, some may have changed, it was, um, you know, we're also worried about, you know, how, what's their breathing rate? How, right. you know, yeah. how warm are the mice real? You know, like we measured these things, but yes, it's hard to remain consistent. And we, right. I didn't see any sort of, um, not, well, I didn't really measure like a specific period that was over several mice, but oh. we did see enough variation that I suspected it was more than, you know, simply some of the physiological changes. Yeah. But we, I would like to do that experiment very much. Yeah, we, we saw that, uh, I think we, some 10 years ago, we had study where we saw cycling hypoxia in these tumors, but uh, once we treated them with the, an anti-angiogenic drug, the cycling uh, was dampened quite a bit. So in that context, uh, your yeah, study, when you do it, it'll be quite interesting to look at. And, and we're seeing some, uh, some variable hypoxia. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, we use a margin uh, to, you know, for setup variation is issues, um, and and uh, and most often uh, those uh, those effects are within our margins, uh, but but we do occasionally see very large uh, variations from image to image. Yeah. Well, uh, one last question from my side: Does have you considered? Uh, using phase encode, uh, which uh, in our hands uh, showed uh, improved spatial, improved spectral, improved temporal resolutions. No, I mean- I can answer a little bit on this question. I'm Boris Apple, I'm Otto MCTO <laughs> and Hortz collaborator. So um, we, we're trying to do actively to, to, to use the SPI technology. Um, currently, the, the problem what we have is the, I mean, it's somewhat instrumentational problem because you have to do a lot of measurements in the limited time mm -hmm. for, for SPI acquisition. And um, we still struggling to get a really high quality images with high resolution. Uh, uh, out of this. However, it's extremely promising. The, the spatial resolution is exciting. Yeah. It's a bordering MRI exciting. resolution. 
Uh, spectral resolution requires a little bit of improvement of our mathematical apparatus because mm -hmm. we need to use compressed sensing. And we have uh, actually we, we, we had a have a project with uh, your collaborator, Morale. <laughs> Alan yes. McMillan. Alan yes, McMillan. Yes, yes, yes. He, he, he yes. trained so, with us. Yeah, he's good. Yes. He's very he, good. Yes, so we we actually in the process of accumulating data for him, so he can. We can also send you the code what we have. Oh, oh that's, that would be great. That would yeah. be great. That, that uh, we have the code, and uh, you just uh, remove whatever involves the gradient power supplies. The rest uh, uh, we manage because a three D image we can do a snapshot of. Uh, uh, for a data set uh, for three for three D uh, under two minutes using uh, uh, partial case space compress sensing and all the, so all the advantages of this phase uh, encoding uh, uh, you can incorporate in this and uh, what Ashley was looking at uh, cycling hypoxia these become very useful uh, when you start. Uh, Looking at the we are still struggling hypoxia. with uh, in vivo reconstruction in SPI. Yeah. Okay, maybe a visit from Boris uh, to our place, well, and we'll yes. have no house for that. We'll that will be great. Yeah, we yeah, still in uh, vitro we get lovely, beautiful images. In view, I'm still struggling. Uh, I see because uh, I we showed the uh, uh, point three millimeter in plane equivalent uh, in a field of view of five centimeters. Oh, yeah, no, we, we get lovely images uh, yeah. from SPI. That's, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that will be great, I think. Yeah. My main yeah. problem for us currently developing a proper symmetric uh, imaging. So mm -hmm. the three dimensional imaging we are, we are getting, yeah. uh, but for axiometric, you, you need a little bit uh, to adopt all this uh, smart technologies for compressed sensing because it's a lot of data points and reconstruction needs, you know, this adjustment of field of view. So th 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 those troubles need, need more advanced treatments than what we currently have. What is the magnet? Uh, where do you buy a magnet? Uh, it's uh, produced in, uh, in Ningbo. It's uh, some company close to Shanghai in China. I just oh. wanted to clarify to everyone that uh, this discussion is uh, about single point imaging, but uh, what Ashlyn data showed that was a different uh, modality. Mm. We're trying to incorporate uh, SPI also into Jiva 25. So yeah, the, we have uh, two modalities the, uh, uh, in instrument. Yeah, the, the so-called back projection that Morelli referred to uh, yeah. is, is, is a different, a very different approach. Yeah. It's a different approach. So we want to have all possibilities in Jiva. So yeah, uh, SPI this, gives wonderful spatial resolution. Uh, but we, we still like, have problem in, in, in have yeah. correct oxygen reproduction using this technology. Yes, That's so. why we are not offering it at this moment as a go-to <laughs> method of oxygen imaging, but we will be there. Okay, good. Yeah, just to Thank clarify. You. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Well, very good. Uh, uh, Ashlyn, it sounds like we've got a project for your postdoc all lined up now. Uh, and in <laughs> fact, that further emphasize that perhaps uh, we should call this ultra or mega disciplinary research, right? It really does take a village to image hypoxia in a mouse. Are there, uh, in the interest of time, are there uh, any last burning uh, critical questions? Well, with that in mind, I think we had a great discussion, uh, clearly, right, uh, that uh, touched on a number of topics. And I'd like to encourage each of you to uh, uh, keep in touch, enjoy the next uh, webinars that are coming up, and uh, continue discussions with O2M Technologies about this uh, multifaceted field. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Marty, thanks. Thank you.